So, hi everybody, I'm Carmen. Hello everyone, my name is Andres. And today we're going to talk about the protractor style guide that we have been working on. Yes, so first let me introduce Carmen. So I'm Carmen, uh, as I said. <laughs> I'm uh, Carmen Popovicu on Twitter, if you want to say hi. Um, this is my team. I'm a front-end engineer at ING, and this is my very cool team. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who don't personally know me, I really like cakes. As in very much, very many of them. As in many, many of them. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Andres. This is my Twitter. I'm a software engineer at Google in New York. So um, this is my team. We are called the Stove, Storage Frontend. They are probably watching right now, so hello. Uh, we have more people, but we haven't 3D printed them. Um, I work in Google Cloud. I'm a technical lead uh, in a couple of projects. I run the Angular Meetup in New York, and I'm also a contributor to the Protractor um, project. I did the website, and I built a couple of tools like uh, Elementor. So why do we want to introduce yet another style guide about this? Like, we want to say a little bit about how we started working on this. Um, so one of my first assignments at my company was, because at, the time, at that point we were migrating to Protractor, um, was to create a style guide with best practices to make it easy for developers to write good tests faster. Um, we were also struggling a little bit, like there, was, there were a few tests here and there that were not like, quite proper, so we wanted to find a way to tackle that and to really to help developers write, write better code. So I have been using Protractor since the beginning. Um, I was the first user inside Google, and I'm the largest user at Google of Protractor. So um, Julie, the creator of Protractor, uh, she helped me implement the first Protractor project, and we were discussing, okay, what kind of patterns would you like to know, uh, would you like to have for your application, and how are you going to test, and what are going to be the best practices? So I came up with a style guide for Google, and Carmen also did a style guide. So we came in contact uh, like a few months ago. Yeah, after ng-conf. Yes, so then we decided, okay, we are doing the same, maybe we can, we can make it open source. So now we are merging Carmen's uh, style, style guide <laughs> and Google's style guide, and we are gonna present it today. Yeah, because ultimately we want you all to be like this very happy dude here, like very, very happy Protractor uh, users. Yeah, so we're gonna show you how to do Protractor the right way, and if we are very successful, we are gonna convince the Protractor team to change the logo to this one. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go into the rules, we want to talk a little bit about end-to-end -end testing because we think that's very important and we want to um, share that message across. So with end-to-end -end testing, you have unit testing and you test um, components in isolation, but when you have end-to-end -end testing, you test the entire thing. You test your application in the browser that connects to a middle tier that hits some performance layer. So you test the whole thing. So yeah, and that is important, that's very important, because um, testing how all the components come together, it will really reassure you that your whole system works as you intended it to work. Um, it will also help you not ship bugs to production, so it will, it will reduce the number or eliminate the number of production incidents. And also for those of you who do continuous um, delivery, um, well, probably you want to ship to production multiple times a week uh, or a day. Um, so you can imagine that manually testing your application every time you're going to ship or before you're going to ship uh, is, is not really a solution. It will just take too much time. So when you write end-to-end -end tests, what do you test? You have this famous pyramid that at the top you have protractor, you have end-to-end -end testing. So you test as much as you need to test that will give you the confidence to ship to production. So that usually means that you want to hit your major subpages or your major routes in the site. Uh, you want to test your main user, in user interaction flows uh, and basically pretty much essential elements on a page. But this is like the, the bare minimum that you should test. And then, of course, you can agree with your team if you want your end-to-end your -end test to go beyond that or not. Okay, so now we're going to present the Protractor style guide. 
And we're gonna go uh, over a few things. So we've divided it into uh, five key points. One would be, so we're gonna talk about generic rules and some project structure uh, rules, locator strategies. We're gonna speak about page objects as well because those are important. And finally, about test suites. And let's start with the generic rules. Okay. Um, you wanna go? Yeah, go ahead. So one thing is, um, one thing that you should remember is that you should not end-to-end -end test what's already been unit tested. So you have to keep in mind that end-to-end -end tests run um, in real browsers, so that makes them pretty much slow. Unit tests, on the other hand, are very fast. So if you want to uh, catch up um, speed, then if you can unit test something, then do so and do not end-to-end -end test it. That also means that for a particular functionality, you should not have duplicate tests. So you should not both unit and end-to-end -end test it. Um, of course, it might be that across your end-to-end -end test, you might hit that specific functionality just because it's part of the flow that you're testing. But we, what we're trying to say is, for that same code, don't have just two duplicate codes. Uh, sorry, duplicate tests. Um, we also want to recommend that you use one configuration file because usually when you end-to-end -end test, you want to run your test against either your local environment or you want to run the test against a grid. Um, so I, we've seen a lot of developers that do something like this. So they have a configuration file for each environment that they're testing against. We don't really recommend this because there is a better way and that's the solution lies in your uh, build tools. So for instance, we are using Grunt Protractor coverage uh, in order to create different setups for environments. So then whenever we want to run um, a test or a suite uh, against one of the environments, it basically boils down to just running one task. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the project structure. Uh, when you're dealing with a project, uh, protractor project, it's a node application, it's JavaScript, but it's not like a regular Angular JavaScript project that runs on your browser. So it's node, it's different. So we are recommending you to put this in a different location. So you can create your own end-to-end -end, uh, directory. It will give you the advantage that you can create your own IDE project and have this separate. Yeah, and it will also help you find your end-to-end -end tests much, much faster. It will also separate the concerns between end-to-end -end and unit testing, and it will give you a cleaner folder structure. So for instance, um, keep in mind that we're not necessarily advocating for a specific folder structure, but we are advocating against something like this, because this will become unmaintainable. You will have problems following this as, well, when the number of files starts to increase. So we would recommend something like this. If you're working for um, feature folders, then you could uh, keep that, that same structure for your end-to-end -end tests. Or if you're working on smaller applications, you can just put everything in one end-to-end -end folder. But we think that this is much readable and much more maintainable on the longer term. Yeah, you should group your files whenever it makes sense. You shouldn't end up with one directory and then one or two files in there. And you should do something that makes sense in the context of your project. So now we're gonna talk about locator strategies. Um, whenever I write a protractor test, I spend like 80% of my time finding a good locator and the remainder of the time just running the test and having fun. <laughs> and we wanna point out something like very, very strongly. Do never, ever, 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 ever use XPath. <laughs> so why not? Well, because I don't know, I don't know how many how many of you would actually want to debug this or to, and this is like, so our story is that we went on Stack Overflow and we've been looking for very horrible XPath examples. I've seen production code that was tested with um, much, much hor more horrible um, code than this. Um, the idea with XPath is that it's just completely unreadable. Um, your markup is also very likely to change, so that means that it will add overhead in maintain, for you to maintain your, uh, your tests. And it's also known that XPath has performance issues, um, so ever, ever. <laughs> okay, so the next recommendation is you should prefer uh, protractor-specific locators whenever you can. So use by model or by binding. Uh, when, whenever you're writing a locator, you want something that is short, specific, 
and uh, easy to understand. So uh, whenever you use these locators, it's really, really easy to, to find them and use them. And they're very stable. Uh, there's a few tests uh, that I wrote like long, long time ago. And they never break because I'm using those locators. Yeah, that's true. So for instance, for this example, if you want to select the first LI, um, you have two ways of, to go about it. One would be the, by CSS, um, but the other one would be just simply to use by binding. Um, and that's like, I think everybody can see that it's really much more straightforward. It's, it's also more readable. Um, so yeah. Okay, so when you cannot find a native uh, protractor locator, you can use by ID or by CSS. By ID is very good, by CSS is very good because you can open your developer tools and test it there in the console. It's very, very easy to understand, very easy to read. And it's also good to remember that, for instance, by ID is also a very efficient locator strategy. So also keep this in mind when you're making your choice of which one to use. Okay, so you should avoid text locators. So there's by link text, by button text, by CSS containing text. Don't use those because um, your UI changes all the time. So in my team, we have a great technical writer and he's always changing the text. And that's causing like, some of our badly written tests to fail. So we changed all of that and we dropped uh, the usage of uh, text locators. So the next one is <laughs> you should never use XPath. Yeah, and we put it in red just because if the message didn't come across the first time, maybe that it's red all over around it, then maybe. <laughs> that yeah, if you're going to take something from this talk, it's this, this slide. Yeah, this slide. And the logo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to talk about page objects, which is very important. Yeah, that's, that's indeed very important. So there is, there is one explanation that I found about page objects that really cleared it for me, and that is to think of it um, as like a two-faced man. So on one hand, it's looking towards the HTML, and it knows its deep structure. It knows how to find elements. It knows how to navigate its way through it. And on the other hand, it's looking at the test, um, and it knows to provide the services that the page provides to the user. So it's basically like an API for your markup. Um, and the reason why you would wanna, wanna use them is, well, first of all, because they encapsulate the information about the elements on the page under test. They're yeah, also so, reusable, sorry. Yeah, they're yeah. reusable. So you're probably you're gonna hit the same view in multiple suites. So you don't wanna write the same code over and over. So you reuse this in page objects. If something changes in your markup, you just update the page object and the tests shouldn't change because you're testing the behavior and changing the markup, as long as you don't change the behavior, should be good. Yeah, and they also help you separate the concerns of, of the um, implementation details and the test itself. Yeah, so for example, this one would be like, it would cause a lot of code duplication because if you're targeting the same elements in multiple suites, you would have to copy paste this code. So when, once you move it to, into a page object, which looks like this, um, you require it, it's a node module, you create a new instance, and then you say, okay, question, ask, and then you do expect, um, answer, get text to be this. Yeah, this is going to always return chocolate, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> to whatever question you're gonna ask. <laughs> okay, so the goal is to have um, tests that are readable and serve as documentation on page objects will help you get there. Yeah, and if you look at the page object, you will see that it's basically exposing the, the elements of the page, so it knows that those elements are present there and that the user will interact with them, so it will expose them so, for the, so, for the, so that the user of the test can access them in their, in their assertions. And it also um, exposes this ask function, which is the service that the page provides. Okay, so you should declare one page object per file. You should only also use just a single module exports at the end of the page object file. You should also require and instantiate all the modules at the top. Um, this is important because this will make your tests look very clean and very nice. Um, it will sure show at the, like right at the beginning of the test what the dependency of the test are. So then for the readers of the test, it will be very clear like where to find things. It will also make all these instances available in your um, assertions. So everything will be, be ready and instantiated for you to just 
write your tests. Yes, and since Protractor is asynchronous, it, the page doesn't have to be loaded until you call something on it. So you have to go, go get text or expect or something like that, and then it will try to get it. Exactly. So I think this is a very clear example of, of what we mean. I don't think we, we really need to go into it, but I think that everybody can agree that this is very clear and very readable, and it, it like sets the context. Yeah, so require so. everything at the top and create instances in the top level describe. Exactly. Um, you should declare all public elements in the constructor, um, and that's mainly because, well, as we said, um, the page object is there to expose uh, the services and the elements on the page. So, for instance, for this example, um, what the page object will expose will be the name element and the email element and also the save button. Okay, so um, sometimes you have operations that require more than one step. And you should create functions for that. Um, create functions for actions that you can say, OK, this is like an atomic operation. And it will give you the ability to name this action. Also, you can avoid code duplication by moving this. If you didn't have this, you would have to duplicate like this set of actions in your tests. Yeah, so for instance, if we, if we have this example, you can see that we're exposing this enter name function. Um, that's not really necessary because the page object already exposes the name element. And since it's just a one-step function, then you can also just do that in your test and avoid the overhead, which would look something like this. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't have to be complex. As long as it's readable, it should be easy. So don't declare getters and setters because you, you really don't need them. Another important one is that you shouldn't make assertions in your page objects. And that's really because of what we said before. Um, page objects should be, they're there to decouple, to separate the concerns. So if you would start making assertions in your tests, that means that you would mix the concerns all over together. Yeah, it's the responsibility of the page object to interact with the view and the responsibility of the test to do the assertions. assertions. Yeah, that's very true. So you should. Um, Sometimes you have directives that you use all over the place, or you have stuff that is always there. So you always have a header, a footer, a menu. So you should declare mini page objects. You can call them wrappers for all of these directives. And it's very convenient whenever you reuse, imagine you have a cross project. Like you share this directive, you can ship your own page object, and then all other teams can use it. Maybe if I can interrupt you here, I also just want to point out that. Because usually when you say page objects, most of the people think that a page object um, will represent a whole page, but that's not entirely true. A page object can just be like Andres said, a wrapper around a specific element on a page. Yeah, it's a portion of your viewport. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so for example, this is from the Protractor website, and this would be like a, a DSL, a page object for a menu. So you go to the Protractor website, you go to a dropdown, and you select reference. It will click on it, it will open the, the menu, then you select an option, it will give you a reference to the option and you click on it. Then you assert that you change the route to the API URL and it will look something like this. So let's get to the final stuff, the yes. test suites. So one first recommendation is to not mock unless you really have to. And the reason why we are, well, we are recommending that is because we think that it's best when you are dealing with end-to-end -end tests that you go through the whole system, uh, through the whole application, because that will give you a higher degree of confidence over um, the, how well or if your application performs as it, as it should, as you expect it to. Yeah, so the purpose of your protractor test is to test the whole thing. You want all of the pieces connected. You want to click on a button and you want the full stack to be executed. So when you cheat and you mock, you don't have confidence and probably you have to test that manually and you know every time you go to production, you test it and you click on the checkbox and say, good. And also, um, doing this, it will probably find a few corner cases that your mock data might not catch. So that's important to remember. Yes, the mocks, they, are, they will be good. So use Jasmine too. It's very well documented. The Protractor team, uh, they spent a lot of time adding support for Jasmine. Um, it has very good support, good documentation, and you can use before all and uh, and after all, before all runs once per describe, and after all runs once per describe. That's not available in Jasmine 1. 
And um, sorry, just go a bit back because I, I wanted to uh, add something to what you said is that like for instance for before all if you think of logging in, yeah. pages that, that require login before all would actually be a very good, um, so this use case would be um, um, a very good example of where you could use before all. And then after all, would well, would probably have co some cleaning uh, after your test yes. that you would want to perform. <laughs> so you should make your tests independent, at least at the suite level or the file level. So a suite is just to describe it's a collection of tests. A test is just a neat. Um, so whenever you have a large collection of suites, it takes forever if you run them serially, like one after the other one. There's no guarantee that they're going to run in certain order, so they should be independent. And then once you have independent suites, you can take advantage of protractors, sharding, sharding capabilities, and you can spawn like multiple browsers and run in parallel, and it takes uh, less time. It's uh, super cool. Yeah, and you can also run your suites in isolation, so that's also a big plus. Yeah, when you're debugging, you just run one and easy. Yeah, the other thing that we want to recommend is that you make your tests independent from each other. Um, and that also, again, boils down to being able to run your tests in isolation. I think we've all been through having bugs in one of our tests or one of our tests not really... Um, resulting in what we would like it to. Yeah. So then you always use like an I it or an X describe or a D describe in order to debug that test. And if your tests are independent, uh, are not independent from each other, then it's going to be very hard for you to do that. But there's an exception. So imagine that you're dealing with a CRUD um, scenario. So you have a user, you need to create it, then you can find it, you can read it, you can update the name, and then you can delete it. So all of those tests will depend on the creation of a, of a user. So it's OK to cheat um, if this is going to be like a very expensive operation in terms of uh, maybe resources or it's going to take a long time. For example, in Google Cloud, if you want to test Cloud SQL, you have to create an instance, and that may take several seconds. So if you want to create an instance for every test, your suite is going to run forever. So it's OK to cheat as long as you keep it like short and uh, it makes sense. So for example, here, we have a page object for a list of users. So you navigate, you click on the new button, you enter a name, and you save it. Then you search to make sure that you have a teddy bear. So this is the create scenario. And now you can depend on this previous test, because you know you created the teddy bear. So you search it, you go to this view, uh, you change the name to teddy C. Teddy Charlie, probably. And then you make the assertion that is there. So it's OK to cheat whenever you have this time or resources constraints. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> in, in even larger fonts, do not use XPath. <laughs> ah, yeah. So um, we also recommend that you always navigate to the page under test before each test, because that will make sure that you always start your test in a very clean state, and that the, the changes that you made to that page in the test before will not affect um, uh, the tests that come after that. Yeah, so when you navigate to the URL, you already know the state of the view. So it's going to be clean, and it's going to be stable, and you're not going to have flaky tests. Yeah, we also recommend that you have a suite that navigates through the major routes of your app as a user would, because most of the times you just n navigate straight to that page. But I th we think because a user will never just manually enter URLs, it's good to have a suite that just makes sure that all your views are connected properly to each other, that you can navigate from one point to the other, and then there are no breakage points in, uh, in between these components. Yeah, because when you think about it, it's like, OK, Julie tells you, test like a user. A user never enters a URL. So you log in, and then you go about your business. You click on this link. You hit back, forward. But that's pretty much all the navigation you do. So you need a test like this, because it will give you high confidence. And also, it will allow you to test permissions. If yeah. there's something missing, it will fail instantly. Oh, we're done. Yes. 50, 55 seconds before. So this is the um, style guide that we have been working on. And whenever we get back home in a week, we are going to publish it in the Protractor website. So go to protractortest.org, and you are going to find it there. Yeah, thank you very much. We Thanks. hope it's helpful. And comments, ask questions.